What is up, everyone? Welcome to the newest episode of Power Spike. It's been a, a little bit of a break, but <laughs> given the fact that, you know, a lot of the games in the West slowed down for me, it's like, oh, it was a nice little break. I guess uh, for Dom, maybe not so much, who's just been grinding out matches over at the LPL and Monty as well. Uh, guys, how are you? Uh, how are you doing, Dom? I'm doing good. He's being tortured by the U.S. government, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> getting tortured by the U.S. government. I'm not done being tortured trip. in solo queue, so now I'm getting tortured <laughs> by the government. I guess that's the next step for me then, huh? <laughs> uh, well, I think it, it all comes back to the fact that you were slandering Virginia on your stream, man. Come on, dude. You could have picked 49 other states. You could have picked Virginia less Virginia. sucks, man. No, dude. No, Virginia is great. It's diverse. You have everything there. I love Virginia. Um, there's um, there's a, an author that I read a lot of named S.A. Cosby. And this guy mm -hmm. is somebody who's uh, native to Virginia. He, he writes like a lot of uh, what's called like Southern Noir. And Southern one noir. of the reasons that he sets all of his books in Virginia is because he says the distance between everything is just so fucking long that you can just have characters talk talk and interact for like 40 minutes at a time because they're just like on a, a trip together driving across that miserable state that is true <laughs> there is a lot of space in virginia and generally it is a car needing state uh kind of like california california is a big needing state uh car needing state where it's a little expensive and might cost a lot to run a professional league well get to that in a little bit won't we <laughs> mistakes were made uh, about the selection of location for the lcs yeah well last time we had a show we had lec finals coming up we had the playoffs uh a bunch of mad lions fans that were angry uh and wanted to talk about it kt was down and out it was before they had the upset victory <laughs> but then came back uh and have you know uh they had the upset win and then just started turning back into the kt that we thought um so there has been some happenings in the west but uh, really, the action's really been the East, so we'll catch everyone up with it. Um, let's start off with our first segment of the day here. It is time for a check-in on some of those teams that maybe gave us some false hope. Uh, it's this week's fraud alert. It's KT and LNG. Let's get into it. All right. Uh, Monty, we got to see... N.A. Pioshik, in all of his glory, went and took down uh, one of the top teams in Gen.G over in LCK. And then of they course. have just turned back into shit. Uh, which is exactly what I kept saying they were going to do, guys. I got into a fight with Wolf on the Monty and Wolf show. Wolf became a believer temporarily. And uh, then he immediately had to reverse course after this week, d -Gon. Like, we got some... I, I, I look... I will give some credit to Hanwha Life because they remembered champions that Zeka can play. And so that was actually, <laughs> nice. you know, a massive, massive help for them. Yeah, um, he, he's playing Yone. Nice. Like we, we've, <laughs> he's defeating the allegations of not being able to play Corky by playing Yone multiple games. Cool, man. Excellent. I, hey, I look. This, it, I'm not saying he's a legit player because he's clearly a very limited player. But what I am saying is at least they figured out he couldn't play Corky and like put a, him on one of the few champions that he's really good at. So he he ends up playing the Yone, right? And this coincided with Pioshik turning in a some pretty terrible performances. Um, and then I thought, of course, because KT always goes the distance against SK Telecom T1. But of course, they couldn't do it this time naturally um just complete stomps from the t1 side looking completely lifeless uh kt back to the up and down form that we can expect from them going forward will they sometimes beat very good teams yes if they have a good day are they a long-term legitimate threat no they never were genji also played terribly against them which was a big part in that upset win and when teams tighten things up against them we got to see Pioshik kind of hit his his low point again. So look, I think this team, I, I was saying they were fraudulent for the last couple of weeks. I did. I will say, I did not expect them to be proven fraudulent quite this quickly, but I am pleased that they were. I am pleased that they were. What about uh, the freaks being fraudulent 
as quickly as they've been <laughs> that that like, that was the other one the, <laughs> that is the one where people were trying to tell me this team was was like decent it's like like when i was saying i was saying things like i think dom one is better than than the, the free they'll end up being better than the freaks and people are like no 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 the freaks like you gotta see kdf bull this guy is crack they just lost the fucking bro twice can we shut the fuck up about the freaks like <laughs> are, are they dead now can we are stop they are they fraudulent though? We didn't actually have expectations for them coming into the split. I mean, they're better than no one had expectations coming be. into the split. But like, <laughs> I was hearing things like Cuz is an MVP candidate. Like, you he know, like they're was, they're a team. That was legit. That was legit. Cuz has been the catalyst of that team. Uh, yes, Bull got a lot of the credit, and I was on the no, Bull. Bull live stream. Look, I like Bull. Really well. I like Bull, and part of this is because he's been playing fasting Senna guys, but Bull is actually the lowest economy ADC within the LCK. Like, you can like the way he's playing, but he is very reminiscent right now of Danny's first season where they're not even giving him resources. All the resources in this team go to Doodoo, Cuz, and Bulldog. Mostly Cuz and Doodoo. Um, and so they're playing around their veterans, which I think is a good strategy. And Bulldog has actually been highly efficient in terms of dealing damage because he plays a lot of Huey and Corky and these like long range poke champions. So they had a style of play that was, I think, working for them. Now, were the Breon losses embarrassing? Sure. I mean, they played, ter <laughs> they played yes, terribly they and had a terrible composition into Smolder in the third game of their first set. And I think that without Smolder, like Breon just straight up loses that series. Um, but uh, I think they will also have some adjustments after those losses. And I think they'll bounce back this week. I still think they're better than D plus. So. I mean, yeah, no. Show Showmaker has just looked so damn like he's carrying that team. And so Showmaker at his highs has been, you know, uh, a one of the top mids in the league. But then Showmaker at his lows, the team doesn't. It, it, it doesn't look as going? well. Kwangdong beat D plus recently. They beat KT and D plus recently. Like, are we actually pretending that they're worse? I think they're going to bounce back. Look, if they lose the Nongshim, I will, I, I will eat my words next week, even though Nongshim are also a little bit underrated. They're better than their record shows. All right. Um, so it's a possible upset, but I think, I think Kwangdong is less fraudulent. Right, who places is higher at the end of the split? Fraudulent. Kwangdong. Over, over D plus. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this team is so bad. And I think that also having like your jungler be your best player is just a horrible situation when jungle is just like a pathetically terrible role. Like it is actually just a completely unplayable, terrible role. I'm like, I've, I've, I've done my due diligence. I put in the fucking challenger grind recently just to say that it's like, it's not that I can't climb with the role. I actually can climb with the role because the other team has a jungler too. So it's you're, you're trying to be less useless than the other fucking jungler. Like that is like the fucking goal of the role. Like, having a guy that's like a Viego main be your jungle. Like Cuzzo's best champions are Sejuani and Viego. Having a guy who plays those two champions being your best player, I think is a recipe for disaster when the jungle is as weak as it is. And when you don't have good carry players. Bulldog is is hit Bulldog's been doing a good job at his role. Yeah. He's actually been highly efficient in terms of gold to damage. He's actually been really efficient. Um, yeah, so I mean, I've been I've been kind of impressed with him, but it has relied on getting some very powerful picks. Yeah, I mean, but if you're playing champions like Way, you're playing champions like Corky, you're just gonna have inflated damage because of course. You, I mean, because you just have such insane range. So, yeah. but also, they keep giving him those champions, and they keep winning games. Uh, <laughs> People in the chat they saying, have a style that wins games. <laughs> people in the chat saying Dudu is their best player or whatever. I mean, Lord Morgan, he he opened it up on him not just once, <laughs> but twice. <laughs> like in either two series. So uh I don't know, man. Because now that Dom's starting to convert me a little bit here. It's like, okay, yeah, I did make the point about Showmaker, and they will, you know, if they fall to four. Oh, but are you like, kidding me? D plus, Maker, the only way they win games is if Showmaker has a pop off performance. That's it. Like, there are more paths to victory for Kwangdong than there are for D plus. Like, are you kidding me? Aiming and Kellen have been fucking terrible. Well, that's the that's also the other point. Aiming yeah, is but I mean, so fucking bad that yeah, there's so no aiming, way he's going to keep playing this bad. I mean, literally, yes. Like a player like aiming, I have more confidence in like, because aiming has, it's not like aiming was only good last year. The reason people think that aiming was only good last year is because they never watched LPL, but he, he's he sure. been somebody who has been like a solid player, like a, like 
And that's how I'll describe him. He's been like a solid player for three years. He 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 doesn't normally int as hard as he's been inting. So I could see him turning it around. If he just plays marginally better, they have Showmaker. If Lucid like gets over like the fucking nerves or whatever the fuck's going on with him, <laughs> I could see this team just being so much better than how they like how they've played. You know, I think that, that this team just has way more talent on it. And it's not hard for them. Like, let's say they played a series versus KDF, like a five game series. It's not hard for them to just come up with a few drafts that are going to beat a team like KDF. I love how <laughs> Coach Don. I, I, I like... completely, I, I completely disagree. Like maybe because we're going back into a, a Zeri meta. Like I can, I can see aiming starting to perform again. But aiming's play has been. I mean, he's like flanking turrets with it, Kogma. Like, I mean, it's his... been real bad, mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like, I mean, are we going to pretend like he wasn't like consistently a top three eighty carry last year in, in Korea? I mean, maybe I you can say Deft was better, but I'm a Deft hater. Like, I don't think Deft is good. <laughs> I believe in the, the motivational powers of CV Max's belt. That's what I believe in. Yeah, he d he has made a player or two cry already on broadcast. Um, <laughs> but I do love like Coach Dom being in here, just like not worrying about the fact that uh, Lucid is replacing one of the greatest the greatest jungler in this organization's history, one of uh, the best junglers in the last like what several years uh, in World the Finals LCK. MVP yeah, who, yeah, who has like, less damage per minute than a player like Caria because you know support is very balanced and for some reason. 80 carry supports are like being allowed to be in the game. I'm not ex exactly sure why that's a thing. Like why should 80 carry champions ever be allowed to play support? But you know, it is what it is. That's the angle. Hey, Lucid, look, your role doesn't matter. Stop well, playing like shit and being nervous. Carry is doing more I mean, damage. Go maker wasn't that good. You, you can answer this question by just asking yourself, what role does freak play in league of legends? It's 80 carry. So clearly he wants more 80 carries within the game. <laughs> Don't bring Freak into this. He went on the LCS. He He's went on the dive and had the whole. What do you mean? Don't there. bring Freak He's into this. One of them. He's one He's of the lead many balance people there. designer, isn't He's he? Isn't he in them. charge of it? He is. He, he, there are things that he is partially in charge of. I don't. I don't remember his full role, but yes, he's on that team now. <laughs> it's it's really convenient, Degon at Riot, that no one's actually ever in charge of anything. Don't you find that yeah. super convenient? And no one has any accountability for anything that happens. <laughs> it's like, so he he went on the dive and took a lot of accountability. This was actually something I wanted to bring up there because he did give like the whole dive episode was just talking to Freak about balancing the game and game thoughts there. I think Medios did a good job of kind of. Uh, facilitating some of the, the questions and desires of the community but uh, definitely go check that one out he is thinking about what the game is trying to do from a global sense so yes he has come out and shown some accountability there that was that was I, I actually really do appreciate freaks transparency so I yeah. I do give I'm just mostly joking like I yeah. I think it's better to actually have the level of transparency that we have now into the game design decisions than what we had before it's a big improvement yeah I the mean black box sure like it's good that he's being transparent but I, I mean I would just love to know why certain things are so poorly done when they hit live like okay so Rek'Sai is like one of the champions that I've I played see. like for oh, years, yes. right? Let's get into it. I love Rex. <laughs> like he, Rexai slander. <laughs> Rexai is one of the champions I've played for years. Regardless of the fact that like, it's just objectively fucking weak and it needs buffs. It'll get buffed in the next patch. Besides for the fact that like, it's objectively super fucking weak. It lost like six, 7% win rate in one patch. How could you ever have anyone play test that unless it just broke the second it hit live? How could you have any person play test that one time and not notice that the champion is completely fucking bugged that your cues get canceled by things like stride breaker your auto attacks got can't get canceled by movement like you're you literally have to sit there and queue like you're a fucking zero apm bot in order to actually input your queue damage like how how does that ever get to live <laughs> who the fuck is working there that lets that hit live i played it one game in the first as soon as i built one like tmod item i can realize like hey bro like this shit is not functioning properly i'm canceling so many auto attacks i don't normally cancel auto attacks like that like i'm not that fucking handless that i have no idea how to play the game how the fuck does that ever hit live who is working there that lets that shit hit live one time like you, you just didn't play test it I, I i refuse to believe that you actually play tested it or it just broke the second it hit live and if that happens then disable the fucking champion disable it like it's just it's so fucking bugged disable the fucking champion i just don't understand like how these things keep on like 
keeping uh, keep on going and then when, when i thought when i hear about balance of the game it's like they come out with things like adtf is an op it's like okay these people love fucking stats if it's a top three win rate champion in top lane mid lane and ad carry how is it not op like that is what you fed you fed me the bullshit for years that like this champion has really high win rate so we need to nerf it even though it's not actually strong we need to nerf it because that's a high win rate in iron that's what you were feeding me before but then now when a champion has super fucking high winner, 60% plus win rate in like Grandmaster, <laughs> it's like we're, we're not touch, touching it. I mean, I swear to God, is there any person on the balance teams that's that's challenger? Is there one fucking person on that balance team that is challenger right now? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there is. I don't fucking see them though. I've been playing all fucking day. I don't see one of them. So it's like, where the fuck are these? What are these people doing? Like with their time? Like if you're not playing in the fucking, like, are you playing the game? Are you playing the game? That's my question. So the fraud so, alert turned into Riot's balance team is a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's so fraudulent. So, so Freak so did fraudulent. address the TF one. He did address the TF one. He was like, whoa, what that one. Say? He said they are nerfing the AD side of things when in the next Nothing patch because... changed between last patch and this patch. So why did you tell me last patch that it was actually balanced? That you don't think it's OP. And then this uh, patch, you're like, oh, it is OP. What, what changes is the same though. fucking champion? They didn't do anything to it. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, they literally just say random shit, and then you're just supposed to accept it. You're like, oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. It's like, well, the win rate is super fucking high. It's an abomination. Like, it's uh, it's super high play rate now. Like, what, what could you possibly tell me that would make it justified that it wasn't OP last patch, but it's suddenly OP this patch, so it gets nerfed next patch? Uh, I don't know. I guess it's the way that I'm not, I'm not, I actually, I don't even care. I, what I, he I brought just, up. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm a, I don't even want to fucking talk yeah. about it anymore. These people are just like, <laughs> it just pisses me off. It pisses me off. I, I should not have played the game. Like I took a two year break. I should not have started playing the game again. <laughs> it just makes me realize how incompetent everyone is. Yeah. All right. Well, given the fact that, uh, you know, balancing Rek'Sai has been very difficult. What do you give the fraudulency level of this rework? <laughs> oh it's a 10 out of 10 fraudulency like there's no so like the champion is just objectively weak they they said that they're gonna make it a bruiser champion it's just super fucking weak it actually just does no damage now because they took away like true damage and stuff like that so mm -hmm. in terms of strength they completely fucking missed the mark in terms of playability it feels miserable to play like do you do you understand how bad it feels as a high level player to not be able to move in between your auto attacks like to not be able to move, use stride bigger, like input, like melee, Kylie, you know how bad it feels to not be able to do that. So from the playability, like it's just literally not even a playable champion. It's dog shit. It's, it's, it's horrible from, from the feel of it to the concept of it, to the balance of it. It's just, it's a failure across the fucking board. They should have disabled it. All right. That's the clip. We'll send it on over to Riot and let him know <laughs> how our resident uh, challenger jungler feels. Uh, Monty, I think for the future, maybe we don't start with fraudulent alert because I don't think Dom's going to make it to the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think I, mean, he's that mad at, I don't think he's that mad about LNG, though, because he was never... I, I don't know, Dom. You were never a huge LNG fan, but they, they have been massively fraudulent this year for a team that didn't actually make very many yeah. roster changes. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've been pretty fraudulent. I mean, they lost so many games with Mark. I mean, they, they sabotaged themselves by letting Mark play. That guy has been bad for years now. So <laughs> it is what it is. They also had pretty hard schedule to pair with that. So like, even though they're two and six, like they, they still will probably make playoffs. It's pretty yeah. easy for them to just start like racking up wins. I mean, so they, so here's their, I'll give you the games that they have left, right? So there's eight series. They've played eight series. This is the eight series yep. they have left. RNG, Ultra Prime, LGD, IG, who's been doing surprisingly well. EDG, one of the worst teams in the league. A-L-W-E-R-A. So you probably win six of are the hard ones, right? At, at least six of those. Like, and I could see them easily beating IG or WE if they're getting any type of better form. Like, WE right. and IG are pretty fraudulent teams. Like, WE would have been 2-0'd by JDG if, G if JDG didn't do the, the T1 classic, just try something on game two. Let's try Ruler on ADTF. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> obviously ruler just didn't have experience playing like like he's uh, this is probably his first adtf game all time i would assume like he just never played it before so if they just lock in you know kaisa varus one of those champions for ruler they just win 2-0 uh yeah if guma did it he has to be able to do it um 
what do you rate the LNG fraudulency here, given the fact that you have like Look, this roster full of like studs, Monty? I, I think I think what's disappointing to me is that it it really stripped away everything that made this team fun to watch last year, Degon. Because like what I loved, they were my favorite LPL team last year, and what I loved about this team was that they had really strong mid jungle synergy and some like decent mid and late game macro. And it's not even just like in the laning phase or in the early skirmish phases of the game, like Weiwei and scout cannot work together to engage a team fight in the mid and late game to save their lives. And it, it they, they've lost everything that I liked about them is now gone. Like gout was an MVP player last year. Now he's not even individually performing so well. The synergy with the jungler isn't there. They make super disjointed engages. Their macro in the mid and late game is terrible. So in spite of their tough strength of schedule, they have just been very unfun to watch, particularly if you were an LNG fan last year. Is it just because Tarzan moved on? What has been the big issue? I mean, I think... People were mad about Tarzan's clearly very poor world's performance by the time he got into the bracket stage. And I think that if you looked at this roster and you wanted to replace the weakest player that would have been hung last year, but Mark hasn't been any kind of an upgrade on him. So you wonder why it was done in the first place. And I, I don't know if Scout's individual performance was affected because maybe he still wanted to play with Tarzan, right? And now he... He just looks completely unmotivated within this roster. It's depressing. It's depressing to watch this team. They play so, like they don't want to win games, which sucks because they've got some really good players on this team. Uh, Dom, uh, is is that what? What do you what do you make of it? I, mean, I I just when I look at them, I think the individual play is so much worse than it was before. Like Zika and and Scout were like legitimately yeah. coming into worlds, some of the best solo laners in the entire world, and now they just look like average worse like below average a lot of the games just dying to like weird ganks like just not on point mechanics it just doesn't feel like they're close to as um on point as they were before so i think that's the the main thing that i look at when i see the team is just the way that they lane and just like their individual play it's like Zika used to be the type of player where he would like be shitting on other top laners he would just be fucking the other top laner be up like 30 cs i was like damn like this guy can play carries and he can play like weak side like he was probably the most versatile top laner in all of LPL last year. And now he's just kind of like mediocre. Like he'll get slight leads and that'll be it. Uh, so context for this grade, this is to uh, a fraudulency to the beginning of the year, the expectation to the beginning of the year. So uh, Dom, let's start with you. What did you have? Uh, would you, where did you have them like kind of placing? And then what do you rate them? Uh, I had them like fourth through that? sixth. So I pretty, pretty much the way I grouped it is I thought that like JDG top esports BLG would be the best teams. Mm -hmm. And the next tier would be like NIP, um, LNG and Weibo. That was like my next tier of teams. Um, so like, I guess they're not really looking like a sixth place. Like I would say they're probably like looking like a ninth, 10th place team or like a somewhere between seven and 10 is where I would say they actually are. Um, like they, their score isn't reflective of that, but if you consider like, okay, I could say maybe FPX is better than them. WE is better than them. I'm not going to go as far as to I say do. that. I think that like AL, OMG, RNG, RA, LGD, uh, Thunder Talk, Ultra Prime, and EDG are better than them. So I would say that they're like fraudulency wise, I, uh, they're probably as low as 10. I can see them probably as low as nine, nine, maybe. And I had them as high as four, I guess. So I'd say like fraudulency wise are like a seven, seven or eight. Oh, <laughs> I, I like, like okay. I like how he decides on the scores. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It makes yeah, sense. Like, though. I, I think it's would good. be like if they were actually like the worst team in like right. a ten for me is like if they were like the worst team in or, LPL or something. Or they were expected to win in their tenth place, right? Well, yeah. Well, like, what's, what, what, what would be a four one, fraudulency? Because I, I figured like given your scale right there, they're still making playoffs. Like that would be like a I four. Mean, uh, the thing is, there's a huge difference between being like five, like being five or six or or being seven to ten. Like that's literally gotcha. skipping a series in LPL um, when it comes to playoffs. And also just the way that like LPL is. Um, yeah, like maybe like IG is better than them as well. I would consider. I mean, it's just like ninth and tenth is normally they're just getting like like beat in the first round. So yeah. going from being like a team that I thought could make top 
four, which would be like making the double limb portion of LPL playoffs to being a team that's going to get like first rounded. That's like a seven fraudulency. Cause that's, that to me is like potentially a two, a two or three series difference in terms of placement from where they could be before. So that's kind of how I arrive on like a seven fraudulency. All right. Thank you for that breakdown. All right, Monty, uh, your turn. Where where do they end up on your fraudulency scale? Because you're the no. I I think that's fair. Game. Like you know, they did they did make some roster changes. We didn't expect instant synergy, but I, I guess like I just it's not that I think they're more fraudulent than that. I'm just personally very sad because I really enjoyed watching this team, and now I now I don't. <laughs> at all so and i feel like there are some really good players that are trapped within this roster that with more motivation or on different teams could do very well but the internal synergy is destroyed and like i just don't see the players in an to dom's point in an individual form which i think is probably i don't think scout suddenly sucks i think he probably just doesn't give a shit and so because i think that i don't think he's going to get better and i don't think lng is going to get better so i think this year was probably kind of a wash hopefully he just comes back to korea Right. That's that's the real hope. Can he get on? Can I have one scout for Hanwha, please? Can I have that? That'd be great. Uh, scout for Bulldog. <laughs> sure. I mean, I'd take that in a heartbeat. That'd be awesome. <laughs> TV Max would take take that as well. Uh, speaking of finishing up there on the LCK, we didn't put a number there to KT. Where do we have KT in the fraudulent scale? And we'll we'll do KT to the beginning of the year as well, because I think this forces you to Look. grade differently. Probably yeah, like a Kate, four or like a three to me. Yeah. Like they're probably just yeah. as good as I thought they were. Like maybe not even fraudulent at all. Like they're, they just kind of suck and I thought they would kind of suck. Yeah, they should be losing. Let's be very clear. The The upset win was to Gen G and Gen G played a poor series and was trying things that they hadn't tried with this roster before. I also think Gen G is potentially a little bit overrated just based on the these current synergy that we've seen from them. So I would say that based on the Gen G win, like recently they look more fraudulent, but if we're being realistic, we expected them to lose to T1 and Hanwha before the season started. Like that, that would have been a reasonable expectation. So they're still going to be, they're still better than D plus. They're still probably better than Kwangdong. They're probably the fourth best team in this league. So relatively low, like three or four on the Actually, fraudulent. They're probably tier. not fraudulent at all. They probably are outperforming my expectations. Cause I thought they would be a fifth place team and they're probably a fourth place team. Uh, to steal a line from Atlas, you got a coin. That's KT. They're the coin team. Just flip it. <laughs> See if it comes up heads or tails. Uh, all right. Well, those are our frauds. Uh, for fun, let's throw a number in there. Peak of Kwang Dong freaks to where they're actually at. How fraudulent? Well, obviously, like you beat KT and you beat D plus, and you look like potentially the fourth best team in the league, and then you get two owed back to back by Breon. <laughs> that's pretty fucking bad. Right. That's pretty fucking bad. So yeah, like I mean, from th from those weeks to like being a potentially fourth place playoff team to losing both best of threes against Breon, that's like an eight just in that time span. Now, if we include the whole season, they're not super fraudulent, right? No, I'm talking about just that time span when everyone was uh, on the train and being like, oh, do we have like, you know, maybe a contender for something? No, contender for being fraudulent in that time span. <laughs> I think they'll bounce back. I still think they're going to be fourth or fifth. All right. Well, we'll uh, keep an eye on that there uh, with our fraud alerts. Thank you, gents, for that one. Uh, next up, we have a new friend and partner of the show. It's time to introduce into the AM, which is elevated wear for everyday men. And we're wearing it right now, actually. They have graphic tees. They've got shorts. I got, I've got some athletic shorts that are just great. I'm about to put, put the legs in there. Bam, right there. The graphic tees. They had a bomber as well. Bomber as well, but there you go. <laughs> graphic in the back. Pow. Um, and yeah, so those are the friends over there. They have a leap year flash sale happening right now from February 29th through March 3rd to get up to 80% off. And you can help us out by using the code into the am.com slash LFN. If you go to that uh, URL, and buy some of the wares that'll, uh, you know, that'll support the show. They've been pretty helpful. Uh, Monty gave me a pretty good tip and heads up. Make sure to get large, 
this is a large and normally larges are kind of like a looser fit this is like a fitted fit for your boy here yeah and uh but yeah monty go ahead sorry yeah no they have a very helpful chart with your like height and weight on it and they also do free shipping to a lot of international countries especially in europe so if you are in in europe or not u.s based they still offer a lot of free shipping and they also just ship straight up even if to pay a little bit to a lot of countries they have these graphic shirts but they also have you know, men's basics, T-shirts, tank tops, bombers, joggers, shorts, polos, button ups, like Henleys, like they have absolutely underwear. They have absolutely everything, guys. It's really high quality. Like the screen prints on the graphics are super nice. It's all like very well done. Um, the quality of the fabric is great. We've been really loving having them. And on top of that promo that you said, so starting on February 29th, they're doing their flash sale for leap year. And that's it can be up to 80% off on some items. And if you use our code, you get an additional 10% off on top of that 80%. So there's a really good deal coming up for you guys. Um, please use the into the am.com slash LFN link. Um, but we love them. It, it's been quite quality. How are you enjoying your clothes, Dom? I like it. Actually, my girlfriend really liked this uh, graphic tee. She's really into like space stuff. She was like, she's huge into like space operas and things. That's like her thing. Oh, so. great. <laughs> so that's why I decided on this one. Plus, I just really like the color scheme of yeah, this yeah. one in general. Like, I just think it looks sick. So, yeah, that's why I uh, chose this one. They have, a, they have a lot to choose from over there. Also, I have a hoodie. I mean, I normally wear hoodies. So they've got hoodies over there as well. So that that's right up my alley. Yeah. Yeah. So this, there been... is for everybody there. They have huge selection. Yeah, that's exactly what I was about to say. It was really cool to dive into... I guess their design process and seeing like what are the different types of of like I guess inspirations that they go for and it's I feel like you have a lot of different versions of like a like cyberpunk esque into your shirt type thing so uh, yeah go check it out definitely uh, it'll help us uh, with the show but also again the fit has been really nice it's really making. Yeah. My arms look way bigger than what they normally do. It's a great. I know you're pretty jacked, e God. So <laughs> I am. I am. I am pretty big, but I'm not normally this big. Thanks to Into the AM making me huge. Appreciate it. Uh, well, they're sponsoring our next segment, which is the Into the AM Glow Up, which are players and teams with improving performance. So we started with the fraud alert early. Now we go to the positive side. Who's been showing some growth and a little bit of glow up? Let's get into it. All right, I'll go first because I'm going to take the easiest one. When you're one of the few teams that has no wins and then now you're on a winning streak, oh, give me God. the Giga Chads. It's Breon <laughs> time. Everything's okay, especially when you play in ailing Guangdong Freaks twice. <laughs> to sit here and watch this team lose and go bro and eight or bro and seven, whatever they were, bro and eight, and now be two and eight, it was great. It was a great run. I'm very proud of the bros. Uh, you know, when you're looking for a team to support in the LCK and you don't want to just pit, cherry pick one of those teams off the top, you like the underdog and there they go. So uh, the bros, Lord Morgan, finally popped off. They finally figured out what bot lane they wanted to play with. Uh, they've got Palu, the tallest player in all of League of Legends. He is Wait, how tall a is he? giant. He's like <laughs> how six, tall is he? I think he's like six four or six five something oh, like that he's like I'm, prey size pray you praise that was you know praise that big the, yeah. the player Fudge is, Fudge he was is huge. tall too but he's yeah. like yes, just very large but he's like <laughs> a he's like he's like skinny so he's like a stick and so when they line up in the tunnel like whoever uh i think they had envy start like envy's like you know kind of short uh and then Paulu is just mountain over everyone. It's amazing. Yeah, I love it. I'll, I'll find it. Anyways, that was my meme one. Okay, Brian. <laughs> congrats, Coach Edgar, finally getting wins. Uh, because who is it? Um, the general Umpty tells me. Oh yeah, Coach Coach Edgar keeps texting me. <laughs> Holy shit, hell! <laughs> <laughs> so I know he's been feeling a lot of the heat as well. But it's nice to get a couple wins. I know what it's like to be on a big losing streak. So uh yeah brian they they had the nice little glow up there we'll see how they do for the rest of the second half <laughs> uh bati who you got for your glow up <laughs> well i can't do kwangdong because they just got bopped by brian which is pretty sad um Very i mean sad. it has to be like fpx right i 
I, I think FPX continues to grow in form. Like they had kind of a little bit of a rougher start to this split, but basically, I mean, if you guys have seen the last couple uh, days of games, like the the win over top esports, well, I will say kind of fraudulent at the end of game three there. <laughs> it, it was, it was a, it was a gutsy call uh, to end the game right there. And in general, I do think that they are outperforming expectations. And this is a team where given that the bot lane was Dokdam in life, which did not give me a lot of hope. The top side of the map has been surprisingly good. And especially Milky Way is a very interesting and very hype jungler that seems to be on the up and up in terms of his carry picks. Had some, you know, great, he's drawing all these kindred and graves bands now, still very potent as a Xin Zhao jungler. So for me, they've been one of the more fun teams to watch and one of the bigger LPL surprises. Don, what do you think? Who else yeah, I mean, if I were to pick a player, I would just say, for me, it's just been Milky Way. I think he's just so fucking good. This guy is just cracked out of his mind. I mean, you look at the first game he played. The first game that I saw him play was, was a Nocturne game. It was uh, game one of the season, or it wasn't game one of the season. It was the first series of the season, but he actually didn't start the series. He played in, I believe, game two or game three. And he played a Nocturne game, and Nocturne is a champion that's very hard to look impressive on, but you could just tell from his mechanics that he was fucking cracked. And since then, he's just showed that he's like good on pretty much everything. Like he can play tank junglers, he can play carry junglers. Um, he's one of the only junglers that can that will pull out things like Kindred. Like when they beat LNG, he did it with two games of Kindred. Um, he pulled out Graves, Viego. It looks like he can just play everything, and he's just good on everything. Um, so it's really impressive to see somebody play carry junglers, especially right now because the meta is so bad. Even some of the losses, like there was a Diana loss he had versus WE. He was completely smurfing. I mean, they lost the game and he ended with an 8, 2, and 7 KDA as an engaged jungler. So imagine what his team must have fucking done to lose that game for him <laughs> when he was playing that well. Like, it was just a horror. So, I mean, he reminds me a lot about myself in solo queue, you know? Like, I'm just, like, fucking performing every single game, losing, like, 40% of my game. So I just, I identify with him pretty, pretty heavily. Um, and yeah, he's just, he's just been solid. Also, like, if you look at this roster... You might be like, oh, like maybe Duck Tom and Life are playing better. Like, no, they're not. They're not. No, they, this is really bad. It's hilarious. <laughs> they suck. And Milky Way is still fucking carrying those dogs. So <laughs> respect to him. Dude, uh, Duck Tom's AD Twisted Fate was truly a sight to behold. <laughs> yeah, Duck Tom is just special, man. That guy is. <laughs> I don't know, man. What is, like, right. I don't even know what he plays anymore. Like He's like reinventing himself. He's like a Swain player now. That's like his thing, <laughs> I guess. He, he got he got sad of being, you know, it's tired of being an Affilios, Affilios one, one trick. trick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was some games where I saw him play Affilios where I'm like, is this really his best champion? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess he's just playing Senna. He's just being like a uh, supportive type player, letting Milky Way carry. Just get out of his way and let him carry. Sorry, guys. I was spending a lot of that time trying to find the Talu picture, and I got it. He's just so fucking tall. Bam. There it is. Oh, let me see if I can put that up on my screen. We can full screen. I see it. <laughs> He's just an absolute giant. Hold on. Uh, is it this one? There it is. So if you see the size difference between him, he's in the back, and you could just see how much higher he is than... I think that's MV. Like in front of him right there, he's like a head and a half like taller than him. <laughs> and you can see Bulldog's tall too, but not as tall as Paulu. And like I'm like, they have to uh, custom order everything there. All right, cool. I, I got to see him next to the LPL junglers because there's some giant LPL junglers like Aki, JJ, Layen. They're all just like they're they're all just like a solid like eight nine inches taller than the rest of their team. <laughs> All right. Wait, I can't wait to uh, be able to uh, ask him that. Degon Esports going to LCK very soon with my media pass. I'll be uh, chatting with him be like, hey, how tall are you compared to everyone else? And did they have to make you custom stuff? Um, all right. Sorry. The tall, the Talu thing just got me really hyped just because the bros have just been in a lot of losing. Um but okay, Milky Way has been sick. FPX has been uh, the team with the or with the play. FPX is the player in the team with the glow up. There, um, 
Is there one more, one more shout out that we could probably give that uh, that also has had a glow up, whether a team, a player um, that you guys can think of, like an honorable mention. Um, I mean, I would say Shanks has been playing pretty well. Like Shanks has been, I mean, he was on that WE team that was horrible last year, and he's been playing pretty well uh, recently. So I'll give him uh, a shout out. All right, Shanks gets the shout out. One more, Monty. Oh, uh, I, I mean, I, I do want to say Bulldog because he has actually gotten significantly better than where he was in his rookie season, even if he does occasionally overextend. And he has been kind of one note in terms of his champion style. I, I think this is a player that probably doesn't have a hugely high ceiling, but he's been really stable for this roster. And there has been I think there has been legitimate improvement. I think there has been legitimate improvement. And I, like I said, I keep saying, I think Guangdong is going to bounce back from this. So I, you do have to give Guangdong some props for being a much better team than they were last year. Yeah. Uh, the one that I just thought of now is the one that I thought we were going to spend a lot of time talking about. Uh, if we would have recorded the initial episode last week. And that is, I guess, did they get better? Because we didn't even dive into this drama. Did they get better? Or did Mad Lions Koi just make it to the finals because everyone else was bad, right? Can, Do we can you get problems? better from up? this being your first split? That's my real question. Like, because that implies that we, this could be their baseline. You know what I mean? That's why I wasn't picking any rookies, potentially. I, mean, I guess we did, we did kind of pick Milky Way. Um, but... I mean, I do think that Mad Lions, over, you know, massively overperformed expectations, but also that LEC was kind of lower quality in general. So there was that aspect to it as well. Yeah. Any thoughts real quick on uh, on that uh, LEC run there, uh, Dom? Yeah, I mean, I think Mad Lions was definitely the big surprise of the uh, of the the region. I mean. I think that the the thing that kind of sucks for Mad Lions is the fact that they ended up playing into um, BDS when BDS had this like catastrophe. Because if BDS played on full form and they beat BDS on full form, it would be like in like it would look like a very solidified second place. Whereas the second place is like you beat BDS by one game without their best players. So are they actually the second best team or the third best team? It's like kind of hard to to tell. Um, but I would say like Merwin like was the most impressive player to me. Over the course of the entire split, I think Alvaro started pretty hot and fell off towards the end. But um, Merwin, to me, I think was just like really insane. He was just good on so many different champions. You rarely see that from a rookie top lane. Yeah. Well, I, I think you calling him out early on and then me keeping an eye on him since then and then being seeing him be able to do that, uh, I guess, series after series in the playoffs was very impressive. Eight. You're right, Monty. Is it just their form or is it a glow up from where we thought they were, you know? Uh, but we'll call it a glow up for now. Uh, again, congrats to uh, Mad Lions Koi for finding that much success in their first split together as a team and G2 for winning. That's tough. G2 is never going to win the glow up award unless they literally go and win MSI. It's like, boom, there's the glow up. <laughs> um, all right. Well, there you have it. That is our uh, Into the AM glow up. Some players and teams that uh, found a way to improve on and uh, keep getting better throughout this year. Are there a couple of players or teams that we should have kept an eye out for? Let us know in the comments below, as you guys always do. Uh, thanks for uh, doing that. And while you're there, make sure to give our Last Free Nation YouTube channel and all of our socials a follow to make sure you have the uh, updates on when we have our shows coming out just for you. <clears throat> Next up. Oh, sorry. <coughs> there we go. Got that. Next up. Uh, Monty, it's time for a check-in on our uh, long shot picks. So we got to make it for this week. But before we go to this week's uh, picks for the long shot uh, brought to you by Esports Bet, we've we got to look at last week's where I think a lot of us went boom because of the damn KT win. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, uh, the the ones that we that we actually had on our last show went really quite well. It, it, look, we only need to hit one of the long shot ones, right? That's that's the key here. Yeah. Um, and we actually we actually I I hit 
my parlay. So we were up actually quite a bit <laughs> as a result of that. Because you guys hit the parlay in week one, yes. right? Thanks, if Lord. you guys remember. Um, and the last time we did this show, uh, I actually hit my parlay, which was um, I, w I ended up going up 3,300 as a result of that. So I, I more than covered the losses on your guys' parlays. So um, as long as thank God. Yeah, your parlay was, was the <laughs> Nongshim over Bro, Gen G over Hongwa Life, and Kwang Dong Freaks over uh, Fear X. And that yes. was that yep. was the big one there. Dom, you had yep. uh, Thunder Talk over Anyone's Legends, Anyone Legend over OMG, and then World Elite over EDG. Yeah, he, those, the Thunder yeah. Talk, the Thunder Talk versus Rare Adam one was disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> they, they should have fucking hit that one too. Like they should have won that series. It was so disgusting. But because Dom almost got his, is. Dom almost got his. Uh, you're oh. you're insane. Like five five parlay D gone. Um, it went boom on the first game. <laughs> yeah, but you yeah, it did go boom on the first game. Tragic. Yeah, and then you you picked the the Gen G over KT, uh, which obviously was an upset as well. So. Yeah, um, I thought but, that was yeah. the safest one. That was, I was like, okay, cool. We'll just stack them up together. Let's just follow the line. Did not work. <laughs> All right. Let's take a look on what we've got for this week, Monty. Yeah. Okay. So mine, I'm, I'm going to go for an LCK. I'm, I'm going to go for a more, I would say, kind of reasonable one this time around, uh, which is my parlay is going to be Katie Rolster over d plus right which has 1.8 odds so I, even though i got burned a million times by kt rolster i'm still doing it again and then i'm taking fpx over weibo which is 4.7 odds so i'm just taking the two games because i the 4.7 is still very strong so fpx over weibo for me and then on top of that kt over over d plus so that's my my two-way parlay for 4.7 odds All right, I'm looking over at LCS right now. FlyQuest, who is decidedly a FlyQuest better team. is an underdog against yeah, Cloud9. Cloud I'm just going to put that out there. I saw it's that one. I underdog. Was, I was tempted. <laughs> mm, yeah, like, actually, you have a lot of, like, close matchups here, according to the odds, in uh, on Saturday's matches with Cloud9 versus FlyQuest, NRG versus Team Liquid. And uh, Shopify Rebellion against Immortals. The 100 Thieves of Dignitas one is the one that's most skewed uh, with Dignitas at 2.5 odds, but I just can't trust him, especially against the kids. The 100 Thieves kids have been pretty good. Give me, give me Fly Quest over Cloud9, I think is, is a good one. Uh, let's see. Fly Quest over Cloud9 and... Is there another upset somewhere over there? And then on Sunday, Shopify Rebellion over Dignitas. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I like those odds. Yeah, keeps so fly over Cloud Nine. Yeah, Shopify over Dignitas. Yeah, we'll we'll uh, keep it there at a two game parlay as well. All right, Dom, what you got for us? All right, I have got FPX over NIP. That's going to be Ooh. some good odds right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's um, spicy. Yeah, the, that was good. We took that on Competitive Edge. Uh, we took that yeah. on Competitive Edge this week. I think that's that's definitely ball. I mean, it just comes down to, like, does Milky Way pop the fuck off? Like, he could, he could definitely do it. Um, so I'll take FPX over NIP, and then I'll take uh, Top Esports over IG. I'll parlay it with Top Esports over IG. Um, and then I will parlay all of that with uh, WE over RNG. Tell me what the odds are over there. <laughs> pretty good. So you had one point. Uh, let's see. So your upset with uh, FPX over NIP is. 4. I mean, it's going to be huge because that four point two is just one match, right? Yeah. So Dom's Dom's really going big. We'll see if that pays off. We'll see if that pays off. I love it though. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, man, because like those upsets happen all the time in the LPL, so it gets really scary. <laughs> yeah, you gotta like people also have to understand like the way the lpl is like with the schedule and travel and all this stuff like it's uh it's something where it, like players just get worn out like you're just gonna drop a series and the teams are the teams that are that that are 
playing they have very unique styles and you have like, if you're not ready to play against a certain player a certain style certain champions i mean you can just lose so easily that's part of the reason why omg was so good in regular season last year was because they just didn't play like anyone else so when you played against them you have to consider all these melee mid laners from cream you have to consider like the rumble okay we're banning rumble now there's op champions left up oh shit now we like pick something where able got a good samira game it's just pretty hard to like do all this when you're preparing for multiple teams every single week and traveling yeah uh it's almost like as flippy as best of once <laughs> <laughs> that's why lcs scares me man i mean because I, I look at that and i'm like i think in a best of three fly quest wins but that best of one is terrifying yeah <laughs> uh just and also it, like it's like it, it's like one it's it just because you watch those games and it's like a level one happens and then fly quest loses the level one and you're just like well fuck that's it it's all yeah. <laughs> it's lcs they're gonna throw someone's gonna throw or at least make it interesting um uh, speaking of lcs and lcs returning did you guys watch the cloud nine documentary or i guess they are yeah, coming back out with the uh oh i haven't seen it yet yeah they're they're doing a weekly weekly i guess like behind the behind the scenes of the league team um what what did you think of it tom um I don't know. I was just really triggered by Miffy. Mm. Like, I don't know. When I hear the coach, okay, so you see like where Cloud9 is positioned. Six teams make playoffs in LCS. They have five games to go and they have one game up on Immortals and Shopify Rebellion. They're tied with Dignitas Energy. And to just hear the coach say like, like, yeah, there's a pretty good chance we don't make playoffs. It's like, just fuck you, man. Like, actually, <laughs> like, what the fuck is that? Like, and considering that in the second round, Robin, they've already played NRG and 100 Thieves, right? So the teams they have left are FlyQuest, TL, Dignitas, IMT, Shopify, Rebellion. You're not confident. Like, what, what? how many wins do you need to make playoffs? Probably like six or seven, realistically. That felt, that felt like make movie it magic. Six. I'm giving, I'm giving uh, Mithy a pass here. That felt like movie magic because this whole episode, when you go watch it, Monty, you, you, I think you'll understand. This whole episode felt like... The apology tour for the two new guys on the team because it barely featured <laughs> Blabber, Berserker, and Fudge. And it was just JoJo and Vulcan like, hey, what it's like uh, adjusting to the team. And then at the Vulcan's end... Vulcan's already like, been on this team. What adjustments does he need? And then it's <laughs> them apologizing to like the fans <laughs> on like losing. It, and then Mithy in the Do middle, they apologize I, to Kia? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think they shouted out that they they did shout out Kia in there about like some of their uh what is it there after they had like the Kia festival one of those days after the thing and like one of the guys won like a free shirt. It was like thanks Kia. It's like ah yes, gotta sneak that in. Well there. if they Make keep the content. If, if they keep losing, Cloud9 can just uh do Kia killed in action content and they can sponsor <laughs> they can sponsor Cloud9's gray screens. That's my idea. If we can sponsor breaks in KitKat, we can absolutely have a gray screen Kia sponsor. That's right. We had uh the the pagoda pause in the LCS now. <laughs> we have the Kia gray screens. I love it. That's a good one, dude. That was for free. <laughs> Both Cloud9 and NRG, you could take. Those and there. I say, I say this as somebody who owns a Kia and actually quite likes my Sorento. So I'm, I am a Kia fan and customer. That's right, Monty. <laughs> Plant the seats now. Thank you, Kia. Um, I, I have a Honda, so thank you, Honda, Team Liquid. All right, <laughs> let's get out of here. Thanks to our friends over at uh, Esports Bet for our long shot for the week. Let's see yep. if one of us will hit it and cover. Also. Yeah, also, we do have our uh, match of the week, which is going to be KT versus D plus guys. So mm -hmm. as usual with our match of the week, there are many ways in which you can enter the free raffle for up to $20 USDT. You can either sign up with an account using our referral link as a new customer. That'll enter you. You can go to Competitive Edge on the Esports Bet YouTube channel and leave a comment with your Esports Bet Me username. That'll enter you. Or you put $10 on the match of the week, and then you can get double. So up to $40 USDT if you win the raffle. And guys, you can also get $5 USDT in your account if you join their Telegram group via the QR code on your screen right now. So many fun ways to get free money on your account over at Esports Bet. Match the week, Telegram account. There you go. Thanks to our friends over at Esports Bet. Make sure to play responsibly. All right. Uh, 
Next up, we've we've talked about it a little bit. It took a little bit of a break, uh, but the LCS is back. And over the break, good old uh, the, the break that no one asked for and no one wanted. Yeah, wait. So Monty, <laughs> so yeah, like we'll get into it here right now. It's Galaxy Brain Club time, where the biggest brains talk about the topic of the day. And today's topic is the state of the LCS heading into the regular season. Let's take a look. Okay, two week break in the middle of the season, so that Valorant, the game that people care about more inside the company, uh, will have their time in the studio. Uh, and now we're back to LCS. Yeah, you Monty. know, I love I love Tarek's co stream the esport uh, as much as anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Tarek is what I think he had like 70, 60, 70, 80,000. I think the viewership for VCT Americas at that time was like 40, 50,000 on the main broadcast. Like it's just the co-streaming of Tarek in the studio was greater than. Oh, you should the, see what Biano like, does to CB lol, bro. <laughs> yeah, have, like, like all the viewership to, now. <laughs> he'll have 60 to 80,000 viewers and CB lol will have like 15 to 20. That's so nuts. It's I was actually, like, when, oh yeah. The other thing that happened uh, while well, we're just talking to the state of like kind of like Riot Esports right now, when the broadcast went down in LEC in the final match of the series, the co streamers' streams did not go down. The broadcast, they were in the same network, right? They were inside the studio in the co streaming area, did not go down. Cadrill broke like 112, like I, I don't even know how many hundred thousands yeah. that he had, but it was he, he went from 75k to 175k the second it went down because yeah. everyone was trying to find an English broadcast. It was the only one up. He's the only coast river that can do yeah. English. One of those guys there. So uh, I guess with the state of LCS, co-streaming being a large part of it, scheduling be a part of it. How do we feel like it's been so far, Monty? And where do you think uh it's uh i guess it could be better and where do we want to give the props so i do think we should get the the good stuff out in front because there have been real improvements like first off having two fewer teams whether it's random happenstance look there could be a lot of factors here um i think that honestly the lack or the 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 fact that there has been less money in NA made it so only players who were more hungry to continue playing or to play in a professional league ended up going. So we didn't have a bunch of retirees taking the bag in North America, which I think mm -hmm. is potentially one of the factors that has improved quality of the LCS. Also, higher concentration of talent, even if we did see players that really should have been on teams like Licorice or Revenge. Um, these players who were kind of dropped out because EG and Golden Guardians suddenly exited the league. But the smaller number of teams, I think, has also increased competitiveness. Uh, also, I think straight up, like the broadcast changes in order to limit downtime between games and include the players more has been largely like tonally and from a production perspective and a content perspective, very successful. So I like all of these changes that have been made to the product. Uh, clearly, I think the, the switch back to weekends has been in their advantage, mostly so they also get the raids from LEC. And if they didn't get the raids from LEC, guys, like imagine if this was just the weekdays, right? Because Esports Charts released an article recently that really cut through a lot of the bullshit about, quote, 4% increase in viewership. Um, because they actually show that Bayano alone is now 17% of LCS viewership. And while the viewership has increased, the, the point is that it doesn't increase in a meaningful way because the way they've increased it via co-streaming of people not with North American primary audiences means that there's actually fewer North American people watching it than there were a year ago in spring. So this matters, guys, because the sponsors are paying money. Like, does it matter to Riot Games who gets to sell more skins if viewership goes up? Of course not. But if we care about esports winter and the pay of the teams and the players, it matters a lot that sponsors who want North American eyeballs. Do you think, guys, that Pagoda, a company owned by Schwanz who sells Americans egg rolls, gives a shit how many Portuguese Brazil Portuguese speaking Brazilians Bayano is bringing in or how many Europeans Cadrill is bringing in? You know what I mean? 
or how many Europeans are coming from the LEC raid, because we've actually seen viewership when there's crossover games. So when the LCS starts before LEC ends, when LEC ends and the raid comes, there's a graph, you could look at it, up 88%. Most of those people aren't North American guys. You might be a North, I'm sure some, I'm gonna get a YouTube comment. I'm a North American fan and I watch Cajal's co-stream. Yeah, of course you do. There are a bunch of people like that, but most of you are European. Most of you are European. So I think the reality is almost certainly North American viewership has gone down. And because we know Bayano has virtually no North American viewers and he's 17% of the league's viewership, I think it's reasonable to assume that it's you know, it's a possibility that now LCS is less than 50% actual North American viewers from the United States or Canada. I think that is actually something that could be true. And that should be terrifying to the teams and terrifying to Riot who are trying to sell to North American marketing budgets. Don, when you see these numbers and you see stuff like that, uh, well, Dom, well, why don't we just start with how do you feel about some of the positive and negatives that Monty brought up? And is there anything else that you wanted to add? Um, well, I mean, to be honest, like, I'm not a like, I, I don't care that much about like the, the overall viewership and, and, and everything. I care more about like the product itself because that's what I like care about and time yeah. watching. So for me, like, I just like that the league is better. So, but I mean, I 100% agree that the, the viewership is definitely not up. There's no way that you add a bunch of co-streams and you're up 4% viewers and like the viewership of the league is up because if Cajal just and, and Bayano stopped co-streaming tomorrow, then the league viewership would just be down. Like a lot of, a lot of it would be down. Fans mm -hmm. are, are coming from CB law, right? And CB law yeah. is on right beforehand. So he starts with inflated viewership too. It's not like he even just starts a stream and you know, yes. the, and league of legends <laughs> and LCS is just on. Monty, I mean, it also just like like Dom's saying, like if Bayano wasn't co-streaming this and Cajal wasn't co-streaming this, then we would see viewership decrease by like at least 25%. Like it would be it would be an absolute and if we didn't have the if we were still on weekdays and didn't have the LEC raid, I would say it is minimum down 25%. Minimum. Wait, where when is it compared? Is it compared to like last year or is it compared to like yes. this like end of summer? Last year, spring. So they were on weekdays all of last year, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's the real story here, I think, guys, is like, if they had not changed back to weekends and gotten the raids from LEC, this would be, these numbers would be shockingly bad. And also, here's another question for you guys. If, if Riot is going to celebrate a 4% viewership increase over last spring, and the reason is that they have allowed more co-streams, because remember, Cajal wasn't allowed to co-stream LCS last year. Bayano wasn't allowed to co-stream LCS last year. So why is it that if they are celebrating an increase in viewership, why were they ever blocking these guys from co-streaming in the first place? Why did they have co-stream policies where you could only do super weeks and playoffs? Like, riddle me that. If, if this is worth celebrating and we know exactly why viewership is up and it's because of co-streaming, why wasn't this allowed previously? Tell me that. Tell me that. Well, those people probably are, uh, those people aren't there anymore. <laughs> oh, no, those people are still there. The God, those none of those people got fired. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Well, as the positive one here, what can Raya do to change this on the on the on the uh, uh, I guess on the on the I guess broadcast and LCS as the product side, not the gameplay side. We'll get to that in a second, Tom. <laughs> Keep it a good product for a for a longer period of time. Like, <laughs> yeah. The fact that the the product was better right now is what would drive growth eventually. Just the issue is that it hasn't been like this for a long time, so that's why, you know, right now it's just not a. It, it's it, like they're always changing things, right? So because there's no consistency in the broadcast for like years, like it went to to weekdays and. You know, there was, there was uh, issues with, like, the talent, and they, they did different formats. Like, if since there's been no consistency, like, it feels like they haven't been able to build on anything. So I think the biggest way that they grow now is just through consistency, the same way that, like, any streamer would grow. So recently, 
I, I am a crusader for all regions need to feature primarily best of three or best of five play. I actually don't mind the fact that LEC does the single best of one round robin. It's kind of like an interesting, you know, sample to head into the, the meteor part of the bracket, right? But good old Travis Gafford, as I saw, is on his recent crusade of like, please don't bring LCS, a best of threes to LCS. And I think that this is crazy because one of the reasons, okay, one of the reasons why LCS viewership is low and perhaps, you know, NRG doing well at Worlds did inspire some people to stick around and watch LCS. But a lot of it has been a history of inadequate international performance. And I'm not saying that best of threes will miraculously make the LCS teams better, but I will tell you this, it ain't going to hurt them. It certainly ain't going to hurt them when it comes to international play. Because the problem is, is that they are really woefully underprepared for best of series when it comes to international. It's an entirely different mindset that you go in as a professional team because you can be more risky. You can be more experimental. You can adapt over the course of the series. And LCS teams get such a small amount of time to actually practice this skill set um, that I think it does hinder them. It must hinder them to a certain degree on stage. Plus, it's just a waste of time, guys. I'm sure Dom can talk to this, but the number of players that have told me the worst feeling is having to go through LA traffic to fucking get to the studio. You sit around and wait for hours while you warm up. You have to do your media stuff afterwards. You sit on stage for one game. You lose, you lose a game in a freak accident in the first four minutes, and then you just go home. It literally wastes an entire day of your time and you don't even really have a chance to play a lot of the time or you just play, you know, you play the one game and it's like close or whatever. And then you just walk away. And you have to remember that every time a team goes into the studio to play, it takes a lot of time. And so by adding, by playing a best of three, you get a lot more competitive time for the same amount of extra bullshit that you have to do logistically. It, Tom, we've talked about it here on phase check just between us in the past on how many games north america plays compared to how many matches yep. the east plays this from a product standpoint is just a good thing yeah 100 percent. and then it's also the fact that this is like the best that the league has looked in terms of uh parity in years right like the difference yeah, between the, the best yeah, the, the difference between the best team in the league and the worst team in the league right now after a total of nine games is a four-game difference. And, and you've had a bunch of, of close matches between, like, the top teams and the teams that are supposed to be terrible. So, like... Every 100 right? Thieves game. Yeah. Yeah, every 100 Thieves game is a banger. Like, Shopify Rebellion has had a bunch of fucking bangers. They're, like, blue-shelling everyone um, over and over. I mean, they beat Cloud9. They beat FlyQuest, like they uh, beat NRG. Like it feels like this they is the most competitive themselves. the league has, has been. Yeah, they beat themselves. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just one of those things where I don't see how it would be worse to do this. Like they could just do the same amount of days, same amount of broadcast days, and just do a single uh, round robin best of three, and that, and then just care about the game score. And that would be and like because you're you're giving top six into playoffs anyway. That would be mean that each team would play a minimum of 21 games and they would play a maximum uh, or sorry, a minimum of 14 games and a maximum of 21 games. Like, I just think that that would just instantly be better than what they're doing right now. So, Monty, one of the pushbacks that is kind of just known is that and, and I'll give some insight onto it. It is expensive to do best of threes because it is a no, it's not. not on day. Dom's suggestion, not on Dom's suggestion. It's not. Uh, okay G explain a little bit uh so if you if you do a single round robin of best of threes then you play one best of three basically per week per team um unless you're in a super week um yep. so you only have four best of threes a week right and mm -hmm. so there would be between four and six games a day Previously, yep. there were five games a day, but you also have to consider that variable time, a lot of that time is switching teams in and out, whereas you can get into games much quicker um, if the teams stay on stage, right? And they have all their equipment set up, which I know that LCS has been very clever about, you know, fixing that downtime in general, but you can't tell me that 
last year when they were doing five games a day well, with switching teams would be faster than doing six games a day where you don't switch teams except for one time. Yeah, I mean, you see it right now in LAC. They do double best of three days, and I don't think there was one day that even lasted five hours. And that's with the fucking LEC pauses and everything. Like, you can get two best of threes done in four hours. You know, you'll have days that are just like two hours, 40 minutes. Yeah. Where it's just like, just stomps. You know, like, teams are just stomping other teams. I think it would be, I think it would be just like a better way for uh, teams to play. You know, like, they would just play more games. And I think that also it's cool for preparation because they would prepare for one team a week. Yeah. So, like, each team would just end up getting like a solid preparation instead of just like doing preparation for two best of ones. And then you just get like cheese sometimes, or you leave something up or you have a catastrophe and draft and then the whole situation is just completely fucked. I mean, I, I think that in general, the fact that six teams make playoffs means that you don't need to have like as extensive of a regular season. So that's like I'm for. LEC. I mean, like look, LEC. The, the answer is you could just switch to the LEC format obviously except do it with eight teams you know what i mean and that would also be acceptable so um i just need to push back this one time again riot defender right here and this is this is just again more pulling back the curtain monty can break it down because he's obviously ran leagues and productions before but i think the thinking here is that you pay for a day of a broadcast staffer's day yes. up to eight yep. hours plus a lunch yep. generally. If it goes beyond that eight hours, you pay them like one and a half. It's like time and a half or double time. Every hour it's over and it's just hyper expensive if something breaks. And if you set your budget at the beginning of the day and you know there's a variable of how long that day could go compared to best of five or uh, best of ones and generally knowing like, okay, what's so run best of twos. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, why can why is it possible to do this everywhere in the world? Why is it possible to do this in fucking Germany with insane labor laws for LEC, but it's not possible to do this for LCS. And if this is really a big concern, right? These are, you know, these are the negotiating terms that you have in the state of California, right? The reason why we can't do mm -hmm double round robin best of threes and go to four broadcast days a week is because it is hyper expensive to run things in Los Angeles, which then we have the, uh, we have to just ask the question, why was the LCS ever put in Los Angeles? Why? Like, why is it in Vegas or Texas, right? These are places where you could run this production at a significantly lower cost. They literally, Riot literally bought the old G4 TV studio and decided that they need it right next to them at Riot HQ and their new campus. They made that decision not for cost reasons, but for arrogance reasons. Like, I don't even know. Like, I don't even know. They don't need direct oversight of the LCS on site. Like, that is ridiculous. That, that, oh. That's ridiculous. Thank you for catching that one, Monty. I was like, come on, let's let's talk about the moving the thing. Let's move the thing. They, they can move it. And, and besides, you know what else? Striker in Dublin, their new facility, their new broadcast facility, does the control room from Dublin of the event that's happening in Germany. That's probably why they laid off some of these people was because now they can do so much stuff remotely from a different fucking country in Europe. Like a lot of the technical aspects of production are happening in Dublin and not in Berlin right now. So why can't they do it remotely somewhere cheaper in the United States? And, and I actually, we were doing the Four Horsemen and I thought Harris Peskin, our guest, had a really good, you know, had a really good suggestion for this, which is that if you really want to develop more fan bases, especially grassroots and local fan bases, why not just play it online have the teams play from land cafes in local jurisdictions. So you have one team playing from New York and one team playing from Miami and one team, you know what I mean? And just fucking play it on the internet, right? And therefore you can actually have local fans who show up to your matches and you can actually meet play those players in person. Like that's an option. They also had an option to create an East Coast studio and a West Coast studio years ago and create a, a you know a coastal rivalry. Right? There are plenty of options. 
and and I, I immediately chat's like, nah, you're playing on lag. Players are gonna complain the, about it. We we're, we're at that point now, guys. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, guys. The LCS is dying. Like I don't know how to tell this to you. If you continue to do the same things that you have been doing, if you do not make changes, it will just die slowly. You, you they, something must be done. You must make dramatic changes now to revive this thing, or it is dead. You must make massive changes. And maybe they won't work. But you know what? It's a fuckload better than Travis Gafford's idea of, well, we shouldn't do anything. Because he just doesn't want to take any risks. Like, you have to take a risk at this point. And, like, if players are going to complain about lag, fuck them, frankly. Like, something must be done. For all of you at home that uh, have a location for the LCS or want to see it move somewhere else, let us know where that is. And if you're for best of threes or not, let us know. Because obviously I didn't do a very good job of playing uh, devil's advocate other than talking about price. Is there a good reason? No, I want I want to know Dom's take on best of threes. Like Dom wants best of threes. Do you agree with my take that like it's just a waste of a day to go into a studio for best of one as a pro player? Um. I mean, I think the the yeah. I mean, the main thing is that it just takes so fucking long there and back. Like, there's so many, there's so much that you have to do once you're there. You have to show up an hour and a half before the matches. You have to do hair and makeup. Then after um, each match, you have to do like video footage um, for like the next match that you're gonna end up doing. It's so much better to just do a best of three um, because I mean, yeah, you just you'd only have to do like one of those pieces per week, and yeah, I mean, you'd you'd have one opponent, you'd just save a lot of time traveling to the studio i mean it's it's exhausting to like go to the the studio at like 10 a.m and then you have like fan meet after as well so i mean you're like you would i would go to the studio like you'd have to like you know wake up get ready whatever you'd start at like 10 and then like you'd play one game of league of legends and then by like 5 p.m you'd like once you're done with reviews and everything it could be like 6 p.m like you might just spend eight hours over the course of like one best of one which isn't like a lot of work. It's just, you just then like no one scrims on those days normally. Like you don't scrim on those days. So part of the reason why I thought teams would do so poorly in North America. And one thing that I was bringing up before is when they did the three days of uh, LCS per week, you would have three days where you weren't scrimming. So you'd only scrim three days a week, have an off day. And then you'd have three LCS days when other teams would just get three games. Like they would get, three games the three games that you would get over three days an lpl team would get that like maybe three times a week two times a week depending on the week like, it's just crazy the difference of, of games being played yeah also the mindset of i think the way that you think about it competitively would change right it, it, you would think of it more like nfl game right one a week that's it that's all you get did you lose because i think one of the big pushbacks that players had early on was like, well, then, you know, I have no other way to uh, show our, our growth or it's just so much pressure for one game and it could get flipped. That's why it's best of three. It, it, it changes the mindset on it, it compared to like, uh, I guess, like soccer or like basketball or baseball, where you have a lot of games and you prep for multiple opponents or you're doing like uh, East Coast trip. So, you know, here we're playing the Mets today and then next week, uh, tomorrow we're playing the Braves or whatever. It, 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 there's less of that. So I think it would be a whole paradigm shift for teams and players and coaches to really lock in on what's our purpose. Let's achieve that. And then those teams that do the best at that are the ones that go to worlds and are best prepared for uh, being in the moment. Whereas right now it's kind of like you have just a bunch of best of ones to play. So yeah, but um, like, like changing nothing is not an option. Like changing nothing got us to this shit ass place that we're in with lcs like well i mean you, they didn't change must... stuff it was just like repeated bad changes it was like <laughs> five years in a row of bad changes that's how we got here sure uh and the valorant issue isn't helping things because i mean people kind of probably forgot that L like people are going to forget that lcs is coming back this weekend i kind of forgot that it was coming back this weekend um and like that's not acceptable just to have random ass breaks because valorant needs the studio Come on. What changes do you want to see? Let us know in the comments. Because <laughs> as Monty has decreed, can't make it many more, much more clear than that. Even though esports charts 
you know, or even though they tried to boost the numbers, use sports charts and Monty's context with it helps uh, kind of parse through the, I guess, stretching. It wasn't bad. It wasn't wrong. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't. It wasn't a, a lie, lie. but yeah. it, it, it they're they're presenting it as if it's a good thing when, for the purposes of the crisis that is happening with the teams, it doesn't fucking matter. And it's right. like super disingenuous. And if they are going to tout that viewership is up, then you have to start asking questions such as why the fuck were you blocking co-streaming if co-streaming make number go up is a good thing? Like, just tell me the, tell me the answer to that question. Why were you blocking co-streaming with people like Cajal and Bayano? Why were you blocking co-streaming from people like Dom from doing it every day? If number go up LCS is a good thing. And that is what may, has made number go up. Tell me why. <sighs> Something. I mean, I'll tell you what they'll answer. say, <laughs> or what, or oh, what, what the, the implication well, we was. We learned that we learned that co-streaming really is a good thing after some robust testing with our co-streaming group. I mean, come on, but it's it's. Obvious. I mean, it, it would be so, like I think the reasoning for it was they thought when they didn't allow co-streaming, they would build back their viewership, and it would, uh, you know, like they would just be the ones that would like all the viewers that were on the co-streams would just be on on their stream. And they realized that it's like, no, we get about like half or less than half of the total co-stream pool going to our stream when we actually don't allow them to co-stream because because we were allowed to co-stream originally. There was a lot of viewers, viewers that simply boycotted it out of just principle. They're like, oh, you don't want our streamer to fucking like co-stream it. OK, you're trying to be greedy. Like, fuck you. I'm just not going to watch then. Good. <laughs> a lot of changes for LCS have to make. We'll see how they do in the second half of the season and how they'll do for the rest of the year. All right. That was our Galaxy Brain Club discussion. That was a, was a good one. Product, process, and everything about the league uh, under a microscope there. Um, all right. Let's close it on out here. Time for our certified banger of the week. And it comes from the upper echelon over in the LPL. It's BLG versus JDG, a palate cleanser. And I guess a before we get into some LCS, which has been good, it's been good, but uh, it's much more fun to go watch the LPL fight. That's our uh, certified banger of the week. Let's get into it. All right, Dom. BLG, JDG, this was the top of the table tussle. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think it came at a weird time because BLG came off like one of their, I mean, probably just straight up their worst series that they had. They got their <laughs> ass beat by IG right before this. So they went in, they went from being like the most dominant LPL team by far with the strongest early game setups um, and just like pretty much rolling over every single team quickly and efficiently to then getting their ass beat by IG into playing JDG. Um, which is, I guess, one of the teams that's considered their kryptonite. I mean, if you're being real about the series, JDG just should have won this series. They were super far ahead yes. um, <laughs> in, the, in that third game. But that was after BLG should have been able to close out with their lead. So it's kind of back and forth. Um, obviously, they're, they're the third like game is hilarious, them. guys. The third game is worth your time. It's fucking so funny. <laughs> Yeah, the third game. The third game is pretty funny. I mean, the third game starts with um, Bin playing Darius as an Uder counter. Kanavi completely griefs Flandre like on purpose. He just ruins Flandre's lane on purpose, even <laughs> after Flandre establishes a good lane state. So what essentially happens is that in the Udir versus um, Darius matchup, Darius will take lethal tempo and try to all in and kill the Udir at level one. If Darius uses both sums and the Udir lives. Then the Udir just wins the lane because he has TP and he's able to sustain starting at level two. If the Udir dies and Darius is able to crash the wave, then the Darius is getting fucked for the rest of the game. So Darius used both sums. Flandre ended up living. He hits level two. He resustains. He crashes his wave. The Darius has Ghost Flash. He doesn't have TP and he has to catch the wave, which means that when Udir TPs back or walks back the lane and he freezes, the Darius is going to have to take a bad base and, and miss a wave. And Kanavi just does random bullshit topside and makes Flandre stay for like an extra minute of time. And then on roams all the way from bot side to top side yeah. and he dives at level three. Kanavi mechanically misplays, dies, which then allows them to 3v1 easily dive Flandre, who had no ghost because of the, the level one trade. And Bin gets two kills 
at like four minutes into the game. <laughs> like he actually just ruined the entire game for Flandre. You know, then they then you know Bin freezes the lane, and there's actually nothing they can do because they lose two v two topside. So they try to bring three people, and then all three of them die to the Darius, and Darius is like five zero at ten minutes. Somehow BLG lost this game, but then ended up winning this game. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, to go on Dom's point, um, it, it, so the Darius gets incredibly ahead, but then gives a shutdown over to Ruler, who's playing Kaisa. <laughs> then Ruler starts to pop off, and the Darius, you know, once he kind of gives over this shutdown, it becomes very difficult for him to play the game because of the amount of peel um, that jdg has on their team like they got lee sin kick and they have nico and they have alistair just to kind of keep him away from the team and they have a very strong front line so ruler starts to pop off and then once we get to ruler getting he actually gets multiple shutdowns over the course of this game they look like they're going to win and then kanavi just kind of walks up to a turret in a very late game siege gets hooked by nautilus and gets picked off in the front line and then they lose the game even though they could have just waited for a baron spawn and then tried to close in a normal fashion i mean um, pretty much oh, kanavi into the entire game made it unplayable for his team and then just carried the entire game and like fed his team like insane shutdowns and won the game for his team and then ran it down and lost the game <laughs> for his team all within the same game it was, it was yeah like so, so he actually performance. did have an amazing kick that set up the ruler shutdown on the darius in a in a fight in the like by drag in the bottom tri brush um so yeah it, it was a it was a, a roller coaster for kanavi but we've been seeing i mean he wasn't great in the IG series either. I mean, Leon coming in and him on that kindred was sad. <laughs> I mean, he he basically gifted the game over to Leon in that series too. Um, so I was, I, I think Kanavi's been a little shaky recently, which, you know, was one of our criticisms of JDG last year was like when they lost games, a lot of times it was Kanavi doing some really dumb shit. I mean, even today, Dom, I was watching your co-stream. He was doing, I mean, to be fair, they, they won again, but it was, it was, it was hot and cold Kanavi, <laughs> it felt like. Yeah, I mean, Kanavi is, is, uh, he, he's having some interesting games. I think the other part of it is that they're trying a lot of like different things right now. Um, so I, I think that the way that people see LPL is like a lot differently than how the players themselves see it. I mean the top teams you can tell that they want to improve over the course of the split and there's this like weird disconnect where when people watch like t1 play and gumiyushi plays like tf and completely runs it down for a game it's like oh yeah it's t1 it's like a happy game and then they come back and they win game three and it's like oh yeah of course like like who cares about that they're just trying something new jdg does the same thing in the lpl where like ruler just game two decides to play you know, TF, Kanavi tries Graves, which is obviously not a very strong pick right now, but it's something historically Kanavi is really good at. They lose a game that they should win. You know, it looks bad, and then it's like, oh my God, how bad is the LPL? It's like, I think the JDG is just trying to see the limit of their style. <laughs> and every year, we, we've gone through the same process now, three years in a row um, as a co-streamer, uh, or, or, you know, as somebody who's watching LPL, where LPL starts the year, they have these messy games and everyone just says, wow, the LPL fucking sucks. It's terrible. And then they just win MSI. Like this has now happened three <laughs> years in a row. This is now the fourth <laughs> year of going through this same process where, where every single day, everyone just tells me that the LPL is fucking terrible and it's doomed. And it's like, I think it won't be that bad guys. I think that JDG proved in the game three versus W when they like, they have, this is the thing about best of threes. When you have a one game lead, you have an opportunity to try things on the second game. And then when game three comes around, what does JDG do? No, they just slam all their fucking best champions. They're like, no, 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 no. We're, okay, we're done fucking around. Varus for Ruler. We got Missing on Alistar. We have fucking Kanavi on Zin. We've got Yagao on Talia. And they just like, even though there's points where like they die and stuff, they're in complete control of the game. The entire fucking game, they just win in like 28 minutes. I think this is completely normal for a team, especially on like patches where things are are, are like coming up. There's a lot of, changes to the game naturally like why would you not try things and and like see what you're actually able to execute on stage 
Right. It's also an extremely long season. So even if, even if you lose a best of three, it, it doesn't actually matter that much. I mean, it, it, obviously, playoff seeding is is hugely important in LPL, but the good teams are pretty confident that they're going to be able to, you know, get to the top of the league. Yeah, it seems like the, the cream of the crop in the East know that the cream of the crop and we just got to make sure that. We give the LPL their due, especially in the spring, because they've done it. <laughs> they've been. I mean, I, I just I had to deal with this on my my power rankings that I did where I put BLG as number one. And then, of course, right after they lose to e, uh, to IG, people were like, Monty, <laughs> you're such a fucking idiot. T1 just beat all the Chinese teams at, at Worlds. Like, wh 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 why are they different? <laughs> I'm like, you guys, you guys realize that like BLG made roster changes and have looked really good. And also it's a power ranking and T1 actually did lose to Gen G and BLG has looked actually like the better team up until that point in time. And the point of power rankings is to adjust them based on current forms of the team, which means in the next iteration by BLG losing BLG will go down. Like you guys yeah, understand I mean, this principle, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, what people would want. They want your power rankings to just have T1 <laughs> as the number one team until they lose like a best of five to, to Gen G <laughs> or if they like, you know, lose at, at MSI. Like because they won world, they are now just and they kept the same roster. They just they would just be number one power ranked from now until MSI, no matter what. I, I mean, I, you can't even remind these people that this iteration, this exact roster of players has won only one of four splits within the LCK. So I'm not sure what argument they're trying to make by saying, well, the roster just stayed together as if they were going to maintain World's Finals winning performance the entire time. And maybe they do. Maybe they do. But we can't just take that for granted. They didn't even win a domestic title last year, guys. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> They won MSI though, which is like really impressive. <laughs> they beat all the LPL teams at MSI, which right, I was really right, happy right, about. right, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh wait, never mind. They got like cancer fisted by BLG. Never mind. <laughs> Forgot about that. I just see so many narratives that I just actually forget right. reality at this point. And also, like, if you're trying to make an argument about the longevity of T1, considering the game between MSI and Worlds was more similar last year than the game between Worlds and now, because they made massive changes to the game, guys, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that you're going to continue to have the same success with the same players. How many times have we seen massive changes to the game change the teams? That said, T1 is currently the number one team. So congratulations. You win this time, dumbass T1 fans, but not because you're smart, <laughs> but because T1 is actually good. <laughs> yeah. Carry uh, just pulling out all the 80 carries and might be the better marksman. According to stats, when he plays marksman, we'll see. Uh, T1 fans, take your win. Go on. For everyone else, there is uh, JDG and BLG, our banger of the week. Make sure to go check that one out. All right, guys, done and dusted. Another one in there. A lot of news have come on out. Thanks for sticking with us as we had some scheduling uh, changes, but uh, we're locked on in now. Uh, Dom, what do we want to tell the people for our next episode? Are, are, are we are we are we fly, are you, we doing it from Europe? Are, are we doing it from he, from NA? What, what's what's the what's the deal? No idea. You'll find out <laughs> next week. I'll there find we out in the next five hours whether I get my passport or not. <laughs> All right. Godspeed to Dom's passport. Yeah. Uh, Monty, where are people can catch you this week? What do you got? What do you have this week? Uh, just doing VOD reviews. VOD reviews. Summoning Insights tomorrow. We swap days um, because of Dom's American bureaucracy nightmare, um, which apparently is just a never-ending nightmare from which he will never awaken. <laughs> <laughs> Don, so, Don uh, highlighted it. Uh, getting your passport requires you defeating the bosses, which are like the biggest slobs known to North America. So get your <laughs> Kakonas out right now. That's what it's like going to get your passport renewed. These people do not care about you and also yep. are in your solo queue game while they're at work. <laughs> it's the same. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just life, isn't it? That everyone is just trying to get by doing the least amount of work possible to still get paid the most amount of money they can make. That's everyone. Welcome to the world. Let's go. <laughs> yes, but generally, like, you don't go face to face with the person that you're, like, min-maxing. But, like... <laughs> 
the, the civil the specific passport civil servants do like they just i mean have have you been to a dmv <laughs> uh dmv close second dmv is a close second <laughs> <laughs> well uh, i mean uh, you know like i feel like if people tried to be like more helpful because like obviously like i'm gonna need a passport no matter what just my like overall take with everything was that like if the person tried to be more helpful and didn't give me the runaround permanently and actually just said what needed to be done they would save time in their day too instead of like trying to make it because i'm not going to just give up i guess what they do they try to do is make it seem like such an impossible task to get your passport that you just give the fuck up you're like whatever man like i just give up i just won't travel i guess but that is like <laughs> then because then I guess they don't have to process everything and they don't have to do the, the paperwork. But like once you make it clear that it's like I'm I'm going to still try to accomplish this no matter how many hoops you try to get me to jump jump through. It's like, well, you saved like like you fucked me around for another like 30 minutes that you didn't need to. But instead of just telling me like the solution to the problem, just being like, oh, this is the problem. I'm like, OK, so what can we do about that? Oh, well, then we have this problem. Well, then we have this problem. It's like, come on, can you just tell me how to get it done? Like, I'm, I literally try to be so nice because I know that, like, it probably sucks to be a passport person. It probably just sucks to go in and, like, do this type of paperwork all day. But it's like, like, I spent something like eight hours at the USPS trying to get this done. And actually, once they spent time doing it, it took 30 minutes. Dude, all right. <laughs> I spent uh eight hours going there. I had to drive I, I an also, hour there, an hour I, back. Like, it was... It was or... I also had my own uh, bureaucracy nightmare this past week, which is I had to go to the U.S. embassy in Seoul because my newest son was born in Korea. And so we had to my wife and I had to take the baby to the embassy to get him to become a U.S. citizen. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> was that easy? It was, was it easier than getting a passport? <laughs> it wasn't bad, actually. I was kind of impressed. I mean, if you've um, done it, it in less than it three weeks bad. of time, Monty, then it was easier than getting my passport. <laughs> well, well, Tom, we will see because he has to be approved. So I, I'm not going to say I, I, I'm not going to curse myself by saying that it has already happened. But I will say I think it is likely it will happen because both of the parents are U.S. citizens. So there's a lot less, you know, weirdness there. Um so hopefully that will go through and my life will not be as miserable as yours. But it is very miserable to try and have to take a newborn to an embassy and deal with bureaucracy while doing that. That is not fun. I could see the uh, passport office now. Rivera, you're a Rivera. I can't. I just, I don't know. You're Are you sure you're a U.S. citizen? <laughs> the worst part was I was trying to like be like, like, so you have to, so there's a whole packet that you need. So you like, I could go off about this for hours, but there's a whole fucking packet that you need. So not only, so you need um, like forms, like you need your actual birth certificate. You need forms about like where your parents were born. Um, you need a, a, a letter of authorization. You need to uh, have proof of travel. Like there's just a bunch of things you you need to, to have done. It's like an 11 page packet with a different form on each page. When you're there, they have to seal all the documents and send it to the government and they have to like stamp it closed to show that you haven't tampered with it. That's like part of the way that they like, that's why you need a USPS agent or somebody who's authorized to handle passports to do it. So when I was there, I was trying to like be like, Oh, so like, here's my proof of travel. Like just pointing out all the different forms I have. Here's my letter of authorization. Here's my proof of travel. Here's my birth certificate. Here's my driver's license, like just giving them all the different. And then when I was trying to do that, she's like, I do passports for a living, honey. Like, like just don't just don't say anything. Oh, I do gave you the honey. Uh oh. And I was like, okay. Like I'm not gonna. I'm like, all right, sure. Like no problem. Like I like like I was. I'm telling you, like I am the most zen motherfucker. Like when I'm on these shows, I'm flaming everyone. When I'm going into public, I'm like the most zen motherfucker. I'm like, you know, no problem. Hey, you do you. Like I'm just here to get the passport. Like no problems. And she ended up not having one of the things that, that she needs to do is you need to sign the letter of authorization in front of her. You can't pre-sign it. So she's supposed to give you the form, make you sign it. And then like she has to stamp it with her official like USPS. Like I saw this person like like here. They, they brought me their driver's license. It is the person that's on the fucking picture. OK, whatever. She didn't have me sign my letter of authorization. So when it got to the Department of State and you don't get the papers back, so I can't like double check to make sure that anything happened. When it got to the Department of State, they just straight up did not process it because they weren't authorized to process it because no letter of authorization was signed. 
And I didn't get contacted about this at all. It was like at the time where I should have got the passport, I called them like, hey, like, like, what's up? What, what's up with the passport? Like, am I getting it soon? Whatever. And they're like, oh, actually, this was never signed. I'm like, how the fuck was I supposed to know that? Then I had to go through a whole process where I need to get a new shipping label uh, from like the rush my passport people to get it sent to the department to say, I mean, this has been like a month of me going to war with these people. Then the most recent time, they told me that it would be two to five business days processing from the 20th. So if you look at like when the 20th is, two to five business days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, today should be the last day that I could have got my passport. Then when I called yesterday, they said, actually, it will arrive on or before the 28th, which means that it could arrive tomorrow, but I have a 7 a.m. flight tomorrow to Europe, which means that if it's not here by the end of today, I need to reschedule all my flights to Europe for a third time and Jesus. fly again next week. I mean, it's just been, it's been the most cancer thing of all time. There was also the thing, oh, I didn't, I didn't tell you guys uh, this as well. There was also something I posted on Twitter. When I was there at the USPS, I signed something with a blue ink pen. So the first problem was that <laughs> it needed to be a black ink pen and not a blue ink pen. How dare you, Tom? <laughs> I am going to shoot myself in game when this process is over. <laughs> this is just so insane, man. It's so insane. And then like also every single time I change my flight, I just lose like a thousand dollars. So like that now it's going to, it's going to be $3,000 because I'm probably not going to get it. I need to know in the next four hours, whether I have it because tomorrow, like I have to schedule, I have to reschedule the flight by 2 PM Eastern today in order to not get penalized the full flight cost. So Jeez. every time this has happened, this is going to be like another thousand dollars. So it's like, it's not even about the money, but it's like, it kind of sucks to just lose 3k for no reason and spend 1k on getting the rush, my passport, whatever situation sorted because of the fact that like I was supposed to get it all done within two to five business days. I started this process in January, by the way, it's now the end of February. I still don't have it. It is what it is. All your efficient pathing went to in game. So unlucky. <laughs> yep. unlucky. It's okay. Welcome to America, baby. You're never leaving. You pay taxes forever. I do this for a living, hun. <laughs> so it, it's fun. actually such an insane process. Like I've definitely missed out on on things with just with with this explanation on like things that that happened that made it even more just horrible than it was already. But you know what? It is what it is. It, hopefully, I I like at least they have all the forms and it's being processed. So that's better than I could have said a week ago. If there's something better that Dom could have done in his passport process, let us know in the comments below. <laughs> if we continue talking about this, Dom's not going to get to sleep, so we're going to call it there. Uh, Monty, for all of your uh, VOD review needs, Dom will be streaming all the matches. Once he, We'll figure out whether it's at home or in Europe. I've got LCS interviews going up this week, and then I'll be there in the studio uh, this weekend. Thank you so much for watching, guys. We'll catch you next week for another episode of Power Spike. We'll see you then.